Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Prabhat Patnaik and we'll discuss some of the issues which are relevant to the four years of Modi's government. Prabhat, we've had four years of the Modi government. Lots of promises, lots of jumlays as, as was being said regarding his election promises. But if we look at the really the broad brush picture, do we see really any change in what has happened or do you see a change for the worse or are there some things which have improved? You know, there are two things about the Modi period we should notice. One is that this is a period in which internationally the Indian economy had a lot of things going for it. You know, it was a very, very, very propitious period in at least two ways. One is that the oil prices were very low for much of this period. And the other is that the US interest rates were very low, in fact, close to zero, because of which there was no problem of financing your fiscal, uh, your, your current account deficits, no problem of getting capital inflows. So, so your balance of payments were really on a pretty sound footing. If you remember the last balance of payments problem that arose was in 2013. And after that, it has been a very smooth period as far as the balance of payments are concerned. So it was a very favorable period in terms of the international conjuncture. But the fact that in this period, there has been really an absolute worsening, I've made some calculations on it, in the conditions of a substantial part of the population, almost more than half the population, notwithstanding GDP growth rate figures and so on which are given, is something which is extremely significant. In particular, if you look at, let's say, agriculture, you take the entire agriculture dependent population, roughly half of our workforce is in agriculture. If you take the workforce population ratio to be more or less the same uniform across sectors, then half of our population just would be dependent on agriculture. Now, if you take simply the in money terms, the gross value added in agriculture is the incomes of everybody who works in the sector. And you look at the amount of physical goods that this income commands, by which I mean you deflate this gross value added in money terms by a consumer price index. You find that there is actually a decline between 2013-14 and 2017-18. So essentially, the farmers, agricultural labor, even the small uh, mm -hmm. landlord, shall we That's say, right. all of them would yes. have lost income in the act right. actual terms. That's right. This is the reality. Yes. If you if you if you take the sector as a whole, there is this decline I was talking about. One can presume that the big landlords and so on would not be losing incomes. As a result, the other people, namely the peasantry on the whole, the agricultural laborers and so on, they must have become worse off in this period. And that's now, the reason for the agrarian distress, the rising right. anger, the farmer that's struggles right. yes, all over absolutely. the country. In fact, I think farmers' anger is probably the most noticeable feature of the current period. And you know, Prabhat, the other part of it, which may not be so well registered, is the fact that the attack on, shall we say, anything to do with the cow economy, whether it is leather, whether it is milk, all of it has also suffered because of this so-called uh, attempt to make Muslims uh, as the cow eaters target them and therefore the lynchings that we have seen and the kind of decline therefore anything related to leather, meat, all of this milk oh, yes. industry? Absolutely. In fact, the figure I was giving you is really agriculture and allied activities, which includes livestock production. Livestock economy has taken a real Big hit, hit, real hit. Um, then you find things like demonetization, which really, you know, in other words, that does not even get captured in the figure I'm talking about, because what happened with demonetization is that suddenly the peasantry found itself without cash. The, they had to borrow in order 
to really begin the next round of cultivation to buy their pesticides or seeds and fertilizers and so on. Now, as a result, that is their debt has gone up. I mean, that's the kind of stock adjustment, not just in terms of income flows, this is stock adjustment. So, 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 so not only is it the case that their income flows in real terms, in terms of the bundle of consumer goods commanded, less now, but what is more, they are much more indebted now, at least large sections of them are much more indebted now because of demonetization, which, which, which really pushed them uh, hard. When we come to the industrial economy, the other part of, shall we say, the productive part of the economy, what is the uh, picture there? Because it could be that while agriculture has declined, maybe uh, industry, other production has increased. Has that happened? No, on the contrary, the industrial sector proper has actually been in a state of stagnation for a long time. It is not very surprising because, because you know, with agriculture in decline, the demand for industry is low. Uh, then world economy has has been in a in 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 a kind of recession because of which the export demands have not been very high so industry has not done too well anyway it you know it has been in virtual stagnation uh, and what is more in order to revive the industrial economy, the government has had a theory which is as follows, that, that really we have to revive the infrastructure sector in order to revive the industrial economy. For infrastructure sector, uh, the government could spend itself much more on infrastructure investment. But a bizarre reasoning is given, which is as follows, that if the government borrows more to spend on in infrastructure, that is a larger fiscal deficit, which is bad. But if the private sector borrows more to spend on infrastructure, that is all right for the economy. Now, this is absolutely no economic basis. But on this kind of a reasoning, the government actually has made the banking sector, particularly public sector banks, extend substantial loans to the private sector, private capitalists for infrastructure investment, much of which have simply been looted by the capitalists themselves. Malia, Nirab Modi. That's right. And, and uh, which is the main reason for the so-called NPAs. So the government has not only witnessed a period of industrial stagnation, but his efforts to revive the economy have taken a form in which virtually the public sector banks are saddled with enormous NPAs and, 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 and the financial sector is in a mess. In fact, what is interesting when you say this, the tip of the iceberg is the Rabodi Balias. But it actually involves the Manis, Anil Ambani's companies. It involves various other companies, including Adani's. All of them are deeply in the hawk to public sector banks. And this is being recycled, or their so-called NPAs are being hidden by some kind of, shall we say, whitewashing. So it's not so apparent. But the crisis is really much deeper, and it really are the favored, shall we say, uh, friends of this government. Yes, exactly. In fact, if you may remember, the government at one point even wanted the State Bank of India to give a loan for an infrastructure project in Indonesia. Australia. Oh, Australia. Australia, yes, Australia. yes, yes, yes. Uh, because that has, yeah. It's a famous uh, Carmichael uh, project, right. if I'm uh, not mistaken. So, 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 so the thing is that, you know, that, that uh, the government's putting pressure on public sector banks to do this kind of lending to favored capitalists uh, is, of course, a major factor behind NPS, even when those capitalists have not actually looted, you know, I mean, have, have not apparently looted in any clear sense, like Malia and Nirav Modi have done. Uh, but, but the thing is that, you know, that, that as a result, the economy now, you see, because now two things are going to happen. One is that the U.S. interest rates are poised to go up. The other is that world oil prices are going up. 
these things coming together would actually mean that our balance of payments current account deficit would not only go up but would not in fact be financed by the kind of capital flows that may be happening. Already you see capital finance beginning to flow out, out which, is why the, which is why the rupee is depreciating and with the depreciation of the rupee there would be expectation of further depreciation which is why actually finance would further flow out. Now we are actually on the edge of a precipice. So this period in which the conditions were favorable, we are wasted. We are wasted. And what is more actually, if anything, the petty production sector has been squeezed in a manner which 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 really has left them worse off. And and now when you have uh, things becoming worse, really the economy is going to be in a complete mess. You know, two things. One of the things is, of course, because of the economic headroom it had, which it didn't utilize. At least the inflation rate was relatively low. With the oil prices going up, we'll also likely to see the inflation rate go up, which means the consumption of the people are going to be further depressed. Second thing is that it seems indications are oil will go from $90 to $100 a barrel within the next two months or so. So how do you think this is going to play out in the Indian economy? Yes. You know, one of the reasons, the, as, uh, as, as you know, one of the reasons the oil prices were low uh, was that OPEC was divided. The Saudis in particular wanted to keep the oil prices low. Now the Saudis themselves are saying that $100 is what they would like to settle at. So I think since the others in any case wanted an increase in oil prices, uh, I think we can very realistically look at $100 a barrel. Now with $100 a barrel, actually it's going to be quite serious in terms of uh, our current account deficit as well as inflation because you see the government could keep the final goods prices low by cutting down on its tax but on the other hand, now we have this idea that whenever there's a rise in prices, it gets passed on. The government is not willing to reduce taxes. As a result, the oil price hike is going to not only have a balance of payments impact, but also have an inflationary impact. And, and, and that is again going to make the conditions of, of the large numbers of people uh, much worse off. And this is a year on which the government which not, will not be able to give major largesse to the people as you would normally expect in an election year. Or if it does, it will leave the next government bankrupt. Is that a possible tack, tack the Modi government could well, take? You see, one of the things that they could do perhaps is to breach the fiscal deficit target. But on the other hand, if the balance of payments become serious, in that case, the fiscal deficit target becomes very crucial for Moody's and other uh, credit rating agencies. And so they dare not do that. You see, one of the things is that, you know, you can have a spin in terms of, you know, projecting this, that and the other. You can claim all kinds of things. But on the other hand, on issues like balance of payments, spin doesn't work. Because, you know, I mean, they are pretty smart fellows, all these Moody's and so on. And even Public TV on. cannot spin it too yes, much. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so, so that is going to be quite serious. I really imagine. I really see the balance of payments as the serious, most serious problem in the coming months. So, depressing news for the Indian economy, and uh, perhaps for Mr. Uh, Modi as well. For Mr. Modi as well. But you know, the thing is that that that. If you have a balance of payments problem, there are kind of two ways of dealing with it. One is that you deflate the economy, you create unemployment, you squeeze incomes, and so on, which is the way they would do. The other is that you can have protection, you can, you can kind of, you know, uh, reduce your imports and so on, but that's moving away from the neoliberal paradigm. Now, to an extent, Trump is talking about it. That actually gives us an opportunity to try some of that route without being called a rogue state, because the U.S. that would have called you a rogue state itself is doing all that. But I don't think these fellows would do that. And that's an interesting point that you make because even in the WTO, there is this uh, possibility of protection and imposing uh, the, the, the essentially 
duties, yeah. particularly for the balance of payments issue yeah. or ex foreign exchange rate issue. And Bolivia has done this. And, and that, that's an ex you know route that Bolivia has already taken. So that does appear even without being called a rogue state, you could still use yes. it. Yes. But that's yes. not likely to happen not likely with to the Jaitlis exactly. uh, or shall we say the Bodhis of the world, yes. keeping Bodhis in mind. Systematically, we have underutilized. We have not even had tariff rates going up to the tariff bounds permitted under the WTO. Systematically, we have actually uh, been, uh, you know, kind of good boys in the sense of not even reaching uh, up to the levels that we were allowed. But that's happened, shall we say, in a secular way across the UPA and Diego. Oh, absolutely. In, in fact, the policies are pretty much the same. Starting it, from Vajpayee or even a yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but the real issue is that, you know, now we're having a no holds barred neoliberalism because the current government is really without any economic imagination. You know, in, in other words, even the little maneuvers that you could do uh, in the earlier period, uh, you can't do now because these people are completely without any economic imagination. Intelligence and imagination, shall we say, is not the hallmark of this government. I know, exactly. I mean, demonetization is the clearest example of that. And followed by the GST as followed well, GST. or the way GST has yes, been yes, followed. Yes. Thank you very much, Prabhat, for being with us. Hope to have you again on, on in this click. And do keep watching this click. Do see our uh, use, uh, website and our YouTube page.